Okay, in this example we're told we have stagnation pressure and temperature probes located on the nose of a supersonic aircraft traveling at uh, 35,000 35, foot altitude and there's a normal shock standing in front of the probe. So let's go ahead and sketch this out. So we've got our aircraft here and there's a stagnation pressure and temperature probe out in front of the aircraft and there's some shock wave, a normal shock wave in front of it. So the flow is coming in this way and then eventually makes its way to the, the temperature and pressure probes. We're told the temperature probe indicates a stagnation temperature of 420 degrees Fahrenheit behind the shock, and we're asked to calculate the Mach number and airspeed of the plane, find the static and stagnation pressures behind the shock, and then show the process on a TS diagram. So the first thing we need to do is use this information about the altitude to find out what the static pressure and temperature are uh, just in the surrounding atmosphere. So we can do that by looking up the temperature and pressure at that altitude using a U.S. standard atmosphere table. So this is something we actually talked about very early in the course when we were talking about hydrostatic pressure in the atmosphere. And there, is, there are these things called the, the U.S. standard atmosphere table. And you can look up for a given altitude what the pressure and temperature would be. And if you do that, you'll find that the pressure out here, and I'm just going to call it P1, is 3.458 pounds per square inch absolute. And T1 is 393.9 degrees Rankine. Notice both of those are absolute quantities. So this is an absolute pressure and an absolute temperature because I'm using degrees ranking. And by the way, just for terminology, this is called a static pressure and this is called a static temperature. The temperature here is a stagnation temperature and the pressure that would be read by the probe here, P0, would be a stagnation pressure. So stagnation pressure and stagnation temperature here. Okay, so we're trying to find the Mach number and airspeed of the plane first. So one of the things that you should know is that the stagnation temperature does not change across a shock wave. So the stagnation temperature behind the shock wave will be the same as the stagnation temperature in front of the shock wave. So I can write the stagnation temperature here. Let's just call it T01. It will also be 420. Uh, let me fix that. It will be 420 degrees Fahrenheit. Let's go ahead and convert that over to um, degrees ranking. When you do that, that comes out to be 879 degrees ranking. And the stagnation temperature behind the shock is the same. Let's call it T02. It's still the same stagnation temperature because it doesn't change across a shock wave. The stagnation pressure, however, does change across a shock wave. It'll decrease. But we'll come to that in a moment. So now that we know the stagnation temperature in front of the shock and the static temperature in front of the shock, the flow up here is isentropic, so we can use the isentropic relations to figure out the Mach number there. So T1 over T01 is a function of the Mach number there, so Mach number 1. So we can use that expression to find the Mach number upstream of the shock wave, and that comes out to be 2.48. Okay, so all I did was just plug in the static temperature here the stagnation temperature here, make sure those are absolute temperatures, and then solve for the Mach number. The K value here is 1.4 because we're dealing with error. Let me just put it at that in parentheses. K of error is 1.4. Okay, now to find the airspeed of the plane, we can find that because we now know the Mach number upstream here, and we know the temperature so we can get the speed of sound, and from the speed of sound and the Mach number we can get the velocity. So let's write that down. V1 would be the Mach number one times the speed of sound one, and the speed of sound is KRT1, that's the speed of sound for an ideal gas. And we already know the Mach number, we just solved for that. We know the static temperature, that's the 393.9 degrees ranking. K we know is 1.4. R for air, that's the gas constant, that's 287 joules. Um, I'm sorry, that, I'm writing that in, in uh, metric units, but since we're dealing with um, English units here, I should write that in English units. That's 53.3 pound force feet all over pounds mass degrees ranking. So a terrible set of units, but that's just what we have, and we, we can work with that. So you have to do some unit conversions here. But anyway, if we plug in the values, what we'll get is V1 comes out to be 
2,410 feet per second. Okay, so that's part A, is to find the Mach number and the airspeed of the plane, so we've done both of those. Now part B is to find the static and stagnation pressures behind the shock. So we, we want to find P naught 2, we also want to find P2. We're given P1 up here, we don't know P naught 1, that's a question mark. So to find the pressure, the static pressure across the shock, we can use the normal shock relations across the shock wave. Now remember, the flow upstream is isentropic, the flow downstream is isentropic, but across the shock wave it's non-isentropic. So we use the normal shock uh, relations to find the conditions across the shock. So there is a normal shock relation for just the pressure change, static pressure change across the shock wave. So this comes from the normal shock relations. And that looks something like this. It's like 2K all over K plus 1 times Mach number 1 squared. So that's the upstream Mach number minus K minus 1 over K plus 1. And we know P1 absolute pressure given here. Make sure you're using an absolute pressure and then so from that and the Mach number we can find P2. That comes out to be 24.2 psi A. So that's the static pressure downstream. Now to find the stagnation pressure um, downstream we we have different ways we could do that. One way we could do it for example is we could find the Mach number downstream of the shock wave, so the Mach number right here. Since we know the Mach number upstream of the shock wave, we could use the normal shocks to find the Mach number downstream. From that Mach number and that static pressure, we could find the stagnation pressure. So that's one way we could do it. Another way, way we could do it is to use the normal shock relations to find the change in stagnation pressure across the shock wave. But before we do that, we'd have to find the stagnation pressure here then use the normal shock to find the stagnation pressure difference across the shock and then that would give us the stagnation pressure behind it. Let's do it that way here. So again what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the isentropic relations to find the stagnation pressure upstream of the shock wave. So that looks like this. So that's that's from the isentropic relations. I know the Mach number upstream of the shock. I know the static pressure upstream of the shock so I can solve for the stagnation pressure upstream of the shock. And when you work that out, that comes out to be 57.4 PSIA. And then I can go ahead and find the stagnation pressure downstream of the shock using the normal shock relations, namely the P naught 2 over P naught 1. And then just simply multiply it by P naught 1. So the P naught 2 over P naught 1 is kind of a complicated expression. I'll write it here, but um, you can find it on a formula sheet for the course, for example. So it's going to take a moment to write it all out. Hopefully I haven't made any mistakes in writing the expression out. Okay, I think I got it there. So we can go ahead and plug in the Mach number in this expression. And we know, oops, I forgot to multiply the whole thing by P01. We also know P01 because we just solved for it a moment ago. And then you can solve for P02. And when you do that, you'll get 29.1 PSIA. And again, like I said before, there are different ways to do it. Um, but uh, this is just the way I did it here. So regardless of the method you choose to solve for the stagnation pressure, you should get the same number within numerical error. Okay, so uh, we're now done with part B. Part C is show the process and, and the static and stagnation points on, the, on a TS diagram. Before I do that, by the way, I just want to highlight that the stagnation temperature remains constant across the shock wave but you'll notice that the stagnation pressure decreases across the shock wave. So it's just something to keep in mind. All right, so let's draw a TS diagram for this process. So there's the entropy, here's the temperature, here's the stagnation temperature. Keep in mind that T0 two and T0 one are the same. 
And uh, let's here's the stagnation pressure we start with here. Call that P naught one. So we're starting there, and uh, we're at some static temperature and static pressure upstream of the shock. So that's these are the T one and the P one. Okay, so this is really our starting point. Is uh, let, me, let me draw that a little better. The P one is supposed to be sort of uh, going from the stagnation conditions to our st upstream static conditions. So we're starting right at this point, temperature T1 and P1, and this is our corresponding stagnation pressure and stagnation temperature for that initial state. And then we go through a shock wave, which is a non-isentropic process. The entropy will increase, so we'll be moving to the right here, and we know that the temperature increases across the shock wave and the pressure increases a shock across the shock wave. So I should draw, I'm gonna move my P1 here to give me a little space, so P1 is right there. So I'm gonna to go to a higher temperature. So that's our T2, and the temperature will increase, so that puts me on a curve this way. So it's, you can see that the P2 is ab above P1, because the temperature, I mean the pressure has increased. So we've gone through the shock this way, and then when we get to our stagnation probe, let me put the P naught two here or P naught one here. Then uh, what happens is, let me go back up to the picture. After we go through the shock wave, that's non-isentropic, so that's where our entropy is increased. When we measure the stagnation conditions here, you'll see that that occurs isentropically. We're just de de uh, decelerating the flow isentropically to stagnation conditions. So that means we'll be moving to stagnation conditions isentropically, which means we move vertically. You know, it's a constant entropy. So you can see the entropy here is staying constant as we go from state two to the stagnation conditions there. So this will be our P naught two. And you can see P naught two is less than P naught one. The stagnation pressure decreases as we go across the shock. The stagnation temperature stays the same, so we're still at the same stagnation temperature, but, uh, but the stagnation pressure is decreased, and you can see our entropy is higher at state 2 as well. So here's our state 1 down there. So that's what our TS diagram looks like for this case. We have this shock wave that increases our entropy as we go across it, and then we decelerate isentropically to stagnation conditions, and that has a smaller stagnation pressure than what we started with. Okay, I think that covers everything for this example, so we'll end it there.